Hey, welcome back to Parker's Pensies. This is a, a little excursus series that I'm doing on Jordan Peterson's Beyond Order, 12 More Rules for Life. This is episode two of hopefully 12, where I cover each one of his new 12 rules for life. Uh, if you're familiar with Peterson at all, you know that his first book was called 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos. This is 12 More Rules, and it's Beyond Order. Uh, as I discussed in the first episode, Peterson is kind of a cosmic dualist. There's a fundamentality, uh, there's equal ultimacy between order and chaos. So the first book helped us with chaos. This book helps us with order. Uh, if you haven't seen my first episode, I suggest you do that. I go over all 12, uh, just list out the 12 rules, and then we discuss rule one. Here we're going to be talking about rule two. Rule two is imagine who you could be and then aim single-mindedly at that. Imagine who you could be and then aim single-mindedly at that. And this rule gets into a lot of the um, underlying structure of Peterson's thought, especially concerning myths and mythology. So Peterson starts by discussing the complexity of who you are. You know, how, how do you know what you are? You're all these different things. Depending on the hour, you could be someone else. You have all these different thoughts and uh, confusing thoughts and thoughts that are going against each other. Um, how do you know who you are? You don't know who you are. You're this bundle of potentiality because human beings are both being and becoming. Like we have, I don't know if he'd say that we have an essence. I don't know if he'd get into the philosophical terminology like that, that we're a substance. Um, I'm not sure if he's even aware of that. I'm, he, he, he probably is. But he talks about us being and becoming. We, we are being, but we are becoming. We have all this raw potential to become something. Um, but his whole goal is that if in this chapter is to explain that if you're not sufficiently aimed at a particular end, a particular goal, then you're not going to reach anything because you have this just all this potential in front of you. Because of that, you need to aim single-mindedly at, at one thing. And become that. And so here he, he gets into his theory of myths. And he doesn't use the same terminology that he does in Maps of Meaning. But Maps of Meaning is really behind his whole thought. And all of his practical work is uh, an elucidation, uh, a repristination. It's it's him taking his, his more academic work in Maps of Meaning and bringing it to you in a practical way with, with really good stories. Now, I didn't like... Uh, I didn't like rule two as much as I like rule one. Rule one was really great. It was talking, he talked about not needlessly denigrating social institutions or uh, creative processes. So he's talking about, you know, having a balance between order and chaos. That's cool. This one, his theory of myths is weird. It's, I, I don't agree with it. So I'm not going to like this one as much. But in order to, um, in order to paint a picture for you of what you could be, he goes into his theories of myths. And so myth for Jordan Peterson um, is an encoded truth, which is passed down from innumerable lessons from mankind. So there's all these people behind us. They've acted out uh, different norms. They've, they've interacted with each other and they've, uh, they've abstracted out different lessons. And then they tell them in myths to the next generation so they don't have to start from scratch and learn something new. And that generation will will edit it and they'll they'll codify it more and they'll they'll boil it back down. Um, it's kind of like like Peterson loves Wikipedia um, because because it's a bunch of people editing a, a document and he thinks there's collective wisdom there. So that's that's his theory of myths that that they come down that they're it's encoded wisdom and it's a, it's a tacit knowledge. If you're familiar with like Michael Polanyi, Polanyi, I'm not sure how to pronounce that name, but he talks about tacit knowledge. You know more than you can say. And that's, that's Peterson's theory of myth. You know more than you can say uh, explicitly. You can't put it in propositional form, but you can tell a story. And those stories connect with us big time. They stick in there and we can learn this, this moral truth, how we should act. Um, so for Peterson, myth uh, represents an important rung on his developmental ladder from action to explicit behavioral wisdom. For Peterson, the world can be seen as a place of things and a forum for action. So the place of things is the domain of science. Science tells us what, what things there are and what these things are composed of 
and it gives us this knowledge, this ciencia about the place of things, the world as the the place of all the furniture in the world. But myth, myth tells us about the forum for action. So in a, in a more deep and fundamental sense, who cares about the, the furniture? Let's talk about the story. What are people doing with the furniture? How should people live in this room filled with furniture, right? So the, the place of things in a forum for action and myth tells us these important truths about the world as a form, a forum for action. Uh, where the, the drama, not just the, the curtains and not just the set, but the drama that's taking place on stage. So myth is really important for Peterson. And like I said, it, it represents his uh, an important rung on his developmental ladder. So this ladder uh, is a system of abstracting moral and behavioral wisdom, which starts from human action and, and interaction, humans interacting, acting with each other. Uh, and then it moves to imitation. So two people interacting, a third, a child probably is looking and imitating. He talks about a, a daughter pretending to, to be a mother, right? Playing house, playing with, with dolls. So, so there's imitation and then you move on to play. They're playing with other kids and they're acting out what they've seen. They're imitating. And then that kind of moves up the rung, up the developmental ladder to ritual. And these are like a, a sacred uh, acting out, a sacred... Uh, rich uh, play and imitation, right? So it's it's being more codified. It's it's a ritual that can then be passed on to others, and this person over in this town can enact the same ritual. To then a drama, and this is a, a story. It's maybe more fleshed out. There's a, a more compelling story behind it. To then a narrative, and this is even more, right? It's going up the developmental ladder to a myth. He then says to religion then to philosophy, and then to rationality. So this is Jordan Peterson's developmental ladder, and this is from his book, Maps of Meaning. And so here in this book, though he's not getting into that, that's what's undergirding his whole thought. That's the that's what sets up myth as such an important thing for having this you know, encoded moral truth, which are tacit in the story, but we have the, we have the job of abstracting out that moral truth from the myth, from the story. So uh, Peterson gives an example of this from uh, Exodus, from, from Moses and the story of the Ten Commandments. And he talks about how Moses is the judge over Israel and all these people are coming to him, bringing him all his problem, all their problems, and he has to adjudicate between them. He's judging between them, right? And he has all this, all these, uh, all this phenomena, all these experiences of, hey, he said this, she said this, and he's got to say, you know, he's got to suss out who's right and who's wrong. And he's doing it day and night and he's getting exhausted. And his father-in-law is saying, you know, you, you need some helpers here. And so Peterson says, well, yeah, it's, it's no wonder that in that context, he goes up on a mountain and then comes back down with the Ten Commandments because he's abstracted them out of all the different experiences. So it's like an inductive process of taking all these all this phenomena and then codifying Ten Commandments from all this phenomena. He's getting them all and he's codifying them. This is a funny interpretation of Moses, because if you're a Christian, you know, it, it it's from the, the mouth of God, like God said this. But I say it's funny because this is what Peterson's doing with his two books, you know, 12 Rules for Life and Beyond Order, 12 more rules. He This is from a, a Quora post with 40 something, 42, something like that, 43 rules for life. Peterson has done, P Peterson's Moses. He's done this himself after all of his clinical uh, research and his clinical experience with people, he's abstracting out rules that he has uh, that he has come to see from helping people with their problems, as well as reading religious texts, the uh, Enuma Elish and in the Bible. So Peterson is Moses. I don't know if he's recognized that or not. Maybe he's setting himself up that way on purpose. Probably not. He's a, he's a great guy. But it's funny that 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 conception of Moses fits with Peterson and what he's doing with his self-help books. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way. He, they literally are self-help books, self-help books. So there's this inductive process. And uh, yeah, Moses just brings out what's already intuitively there. He makes a great point about how the Ten Commandments could not have just been like brand new or the people would not have understood them. And that's an important point. And that's a point that I would say... 
uh, is true because people are made in the image of God. And so they intuitively know what's right and wrong, even though you live in certain cultures and certain sins, certain breakings of those uh, moral laws, uh, certain breaking, like it, it becomes easier within that culture. So if your culture thinks lying is a virtue and everyone continues to lie, you might grow up and think it's no, it's no big deal to lie. But you would say, you know, dishonoring your parents is horrible. No, or making a, a false image of God, making a, a carved image of God is is crazy wicked where in this other culture they think that's fine but lying is terrible because it's it's the milieu that you grew up in and they've inculcated and they you've gotten certain scar tissue on on your moral uh intuitions so that's just a, a free one there for you um but myth helps us apprehend what is a value what we should aim at and what we could be so peterson begins right he begins saying that we're kind of this just see of potentiality. You kind of don't know who you are, and that's still true of us, but we can come to know who we are by aiming at a sufficient end, a sufficient goal. He says we can't really choose what we're interested in, but we can find one of our interests that is good, and we can grab onto that and make that like our, our uh, North Star, and we can aim towards that. And if we do that, then we'll start to get our, our lives in order. We'll start to um, succeed. And so that's that's a really good thing. That's what this whole rule is about, right? Imagine who you could be and then aim single-mindedly at that. Imagine someone who pursued this goal wholeheartedly and then do that. Go and live that out. Go and become that person. And myths kind of help us understand which ones are good, uh, what's a good desire, what's a good intention, uh, what's a good goal to aim at, and then that'll help you aim at that. So he goes on uh, to discuss a lot of alchemy and um, talks about mercury and, and, and round chaos, which like probably serves as the backdrop for uh, the snitch in, in Quidditch and Harry Potter. So he, he does a good job of saying, you know, uh, we do know these archetypes, these like meta stories, these meta truths. We know them intuitively. And, and elsewhere, he talks about that coming out of the collective unconscious. And this is from Carl Jung. So we all have this kind of like collective unconscious going on. Uh, Peterson actually, I think he grounds that more in evolutionary biology than uh, Carl Jung would. I think Carl Jung's more mystical about it. But so, yeah, it, um, we, we do know these myths intuitively. And he says they come out in, in places like Harry Potter or uh, the, the Hobbit. And so we see in these characters, they are, these are myths and they're showing some fundamental truths about the world as a forum for action, uh, how we ought to live, what we should be aiming at, and how you go about doing that. Uh, and then he goes into the Enuma Elish, which is an old religious book, um, and it's got it's a story of origins. And he talks about this as like a psychological depiction of moving from polytheism to monotheism. So you have Tiamat. Uh, this this god of chaos, it's like salt water. And then you have Apsu. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but Apsu is like the male figure, the masculine, the fresh water. And together they, they, they come together and they have sex and it gives rise to being itself, which is like, all right, are they being before that? Okay, whatever. But um, Tiamat is this dragon, this dragon of chaos. And I'm a little bit confused on that because Peterson earlier in the chapter said, Dragons represent masculinity and order and stuff, but now it's kind of chaos. So I, I'm not sure. Maybe I'm just reading that wrong. But at least Tiamat is a, fem a, a feminine dragon. And she starts eating her children or destroying her children because they're noisy. And all the children come together and uh, they take one of the grandkids whose name is Marduk. And they say, hey, you're really talented. You got eyes all around your head. You can see what's going on. That's a big thing for Peterson. Look around pay attention to your surrounding, like pay attention. Look, so Marduk is a, is a hero for him. And he's a hero in this uh, ancient Mesopotamian myth because he rises up, takes the mantle of, of chief God. And then he defeats Tiamat and cuts up her body and creates uh, the heavens and the earth from her remains. And so for Peterson, he's saying this, this is like a psychological account of, uh, you know, all these cultures coming together as humanity grows. And they're saying, whose God is number one. Oh, uh, here, here we have um, Marduk. Like he's he's going to be the number one god. I I think that reading's wrong because even in the story, Marduk consults uh, e, it's, it's e a Ea, Ea maybe the god of wisdom, uh, and he asked for help. You know, so there still is another god. This is not monotheism at all. This is polytheism still. 
Um, but he, he talks about it as a, a monotheism emerging. So a unity emerging from diversity, unity and diversity, right? And we find that everywhere. It's on our coins, right? E pluribus unum. The, the Christian answer is uh, there's an equal ultimacy between unity and diversity in the Trinity. God is one. God is three. Not in exactly the same manner. That's contradiction. We don't believe that. But yeah, God is one God and he is three persons and there's an equal ultimacy. He's not more three than he is one. He's not one more one than he is three. There's equal ultimacy. So it wasn't a historical process uh, unless you're a process theologian where you think God is changing in time and growing up into his being, which is more like the Enuma Elish. Uh, the Christian answer is that, no, like we find order. We find a unity and diversity in reality because it's a fingerprint of the Trinity. So that's that's for another topic. If you want to follow, uh, if you want to find out more about the Trinity, uh, subscribe to my channel. I talk about it all the time with uh, scholars who are way smarter than I am. So all this to say, he's going into all these myths because he's saying there's a fundamental truth about the world as form for action. And we can find that in Marduk. He's the archetypal hero who rises up the hierarchy. He slays the dragon of chaos and creates order, right? He created the world and all the heavens out of out of chaos, literally chaos, the dragon of chaos. And so uh, we need to continually reenact this. And we do as we grow. Uh, kids are like little chaos machines and they grow and their minds grow and they their brains develop further and they create order out of chaos. And so he's not saying like believe in the Numa Elish and become make like make that your religion and, and create a new Mesopotamian temple. He's saying there is a truth there. And it's not that we should be polytheists, it's actually that we should be humanists, right? So that they were onto a truth that they didn't know. They had tacit knowledge. They knew more than they said because they weren't able to say it yet. Developmentally, we weren't further along for not far enough along to interpret the truth and abstract it out of the myth yet. But now we can, and we still have great myths like Harry Potter, he would say, and you know, uh, Lord of the Rings and, and uh, The Hobbit. Um, but now we have the, the capacity to kind of abstract those lessons out a little bit more. And that's what he's trying to do for us. So you don't know who you are. You are uh, this sea of possibility, and that's kind of chaos. You have all this potential, and it's chaotic. So in order to, to guide yourself through this sea of potential, look at the North Star, Find out what yours is and and aim single mindedly at that. So he talks about the necess the necessity of a meta narrative. That's my language for it. Um, but he says, uh, find out what story you're living in. That's a, a meta narrative, a, a narrative beyond or behind or undergirding other meta uh, other narratives. What story? What 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 part do you have to play in the story that you're living in? I actually think that's really helpful. I think we all live in a story, and we live in different ones based on our conception of reality. I think there is a true story, and I think you need to find your place in that true story. Um, but yeah, we you can your experiences can be shaped by what you think you're living in. If you think you live in this story and you're a victim all the time, that's going to shape the way you view reality. If you're super positive and whatever, it, you know, maybe you are genuinely a victim. But I'm saying that that's a great point. The necessity of meta narratives. <clears throat> so. Uh, that that's that's what Peter's get, Peterson's getting at. You need to find what story you're in and become the hero of that story. And you become that hero by creating order out of chaos. And he talks about how uh, these these battles with serpents, these battles with dragons, that they're they're mythological stories. They're getting at a fundamental truth that you will get bit by the dragon and it will harm you, but you can use that potential to then further defeat the dragon. So it's like Harry Potter uh, has, you know, he becomes a Horcrux of uh, Voldemort. And so he uses that like dark power to, he hears the Basilisk lizard living underneath, underneath the castle and he slays it. And, and so I think what he's doing here is he's, he's talking about Jung's um, shadow self. You need to in incorporate the shadow self, the dark, start, the dark part of you, the little, black in your in your yin and yin and yang right you need to incorporate that in order to create and uh confront the chaos uh and create order out of the chaos in order to fight your dragon that i mean it's interesting i think it's i think it's really interesting for as a christian though um let's get into some analysis as a christian i don't i don't think your dark side is like i don't i don't think it's like the 
a, a good thing to embrace. I think there's a toughness there. There's like a intensity and tenacity that you have that you can do without being sinful and wicked, without without grabbing like acting like the devil in, in in order to defeat the devil. I think that would defeat the whole purpose itself. And uh, I wanted to to get into a quote here as well. Um, I think man Peterson was so close here. Um, to something called the Proto Evangelion. The the so many of you probably heard of uh, evangelicals and you think Trump supporter. No, no, like evangelical means good news or someone who believes the good news, the the Evangelion, the evangel, uh, the evangel is like a, a transliteration from Evangelion, which is a Greek word for good news. And so uh, the proto Evangelion is the first telling of the, of the good news. And this is in Genesis. So Peterson, uh, when, when he talks about Genesis and the encounter with Adam and Eve and the serpent, he says in the story of Genesis, for example, the encounter with the snake proves fatal to man and woman alike, who become aware of their fragility, and inevitably, uh, death soon after, they awaken and gain vision. It's also a harsh truth. Predators devour, dragons lay waste, chaos destroys, the threat is real. So I thought that he was going to go somewhere somewhere else with this. I thought he was going to go to Genesis 3.15, where uh, Adam and Eve have sinned, the the devil through through the serpent has tempted them to disobey God. God said one thing. He challenges that. That Satan has God really said this? And Eve says, "I don't know. Let me let me think about that. I'll become the judge. I'll stand over God's word, and and I'll see what's up." And so then she can't. She did came to. She did come to know good and evil, but experientially, not the same way God knows good and evil. She knew it by becoming evil, and so. God's doling out uh, justice. He's saying, "Here's what, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to. This happens to you, and this happens to you because you were disobedient." And in Genesis three fifteen, he says, "I will put enmity between you, the serpent. He's talking to the serpent here, between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel." And I thought that was a great opportunity for Peterson to connect the Harry Potter stuff. And you know, vanquishing your foe and how you're bruised in the process, and like this is a this is an archetypal story, that the seed of the woman is going to bruise the head of the serpent, meaning crush, like crush, destroy. He's going to bruise your head. He's going to kill you, but you're going to bruise his heel in the process. So he's not going to come out of this unscathed. And so, this is such an awesome story because Peter Peterson's whole chapter is about the becoming the archetypal hero, instantiating Marduk in your life. Uh, creating order out of chaos, facing your dragons, looking at them, and then destroying, vanquishing them, and then making order out of that. And he misses this this awesome telling of the, the first gospel in Genesis 1, the first telling of the gospel where this archetypal hero is born of the woman, and he's going to vanquish the serpent, the dragon, and he's going to be wounded in the process. And so ultimately, I cannot be the hero who fights the dragon. I'll fail every time. I'm not the true hero. I'm not, I can't instantiate the archetypal hero, but someone has the archetypal hero of Genesis three 15 has stepped down into time and space in the person of Christ to defeat the dragon. And he didn't do it with sword. He, he didn't do it with sword and spear and shield. He did it in this paradoxical manner by letting the serpent consume him, swallow him up, you know, death, consume the author of life, but it could not hold him and he burst forth. And so it's more of the Obi-Wan type thing when he's fighting uh, Darth Vader. And he says, you know, if you strike me down, I'll become more powerful than ever. Uh, because Christ sacrificed himself and the serpent thought, mm, I'm, gonna, I'm gobbling up the author of life. And Jesus burst out through the insides, right? And he destroyed the serpent. And now death and sin can no longer hold us. Like that's super duper epic. That's the archetypal hero, and now I receive uh, his his uh, his grace and his mercy on my behalf. I trust in him for the forgiveness of sins, and I live out hit the the archetypal hero's journey. I do that. That's what it means to be a Christian, a little Christ. I follow the archetypal hero who actually stepped down into time and space. The author of the story who became the main character of his own story. I do want to follow that. I do want to live up to that because uh, I love I love him. He he died for me. He rose again for me. He 
like live so that I can live. That's awesome. But I, like, I, I love, but I want to be like him. I want to instantiate that. I, I can't do it perfectly. I'll never do it perfectly this side of the new heavens and the new earth. But that's my vision. That's my North Star. That's what I'm aiming at. So Peterson's right. Like I need to pick something to aim at, but there's no higher goal that I could possibly aim at. Imagine who, who I could be. I want to be someone who's like Christ. If I were like Christ, the world would be better. If you were like Christ, the world would be better. If everyone was like Jesus Christ, they loved God and they loved their neighbor as themselves. Like the whole world would be an awesome place. It would be heaven on earth. And that's what's going to happen someday. So that's what I'm aiming single-mindedly at, instantiating the form of the true archetypal hero, Jesus Christ, who came and set me free from the dragon's hold, who saved me out of the dragon's lair, who plundered uh, you know, the strong man's house. He tied him up, and now the nations can no longer be deceived. This is awesome. Um, I think Peterson misses it. I, I, I really do. I, I don't think he actually understands the gospel. It's a it's it's way more powerful than this than just setting your mind on being like a good father. That's awesome. That's not high enough. That's not a high enough goal. If you set your mind on the true archetypal hero Christ, you will become a better father. You will become a, a better worker because you know, hey, I'm not working for myself. I'm not working to feed these kids who are crying all the time. I'm working for his glory. And yes, all the other stuff will come with it. But seek first the kingdom of God and these other things will follow. Seek first these other things. You'll miss both. It's, it's kind of a line from uh, C.S. Lewis. That's that's Lewis drawing on, on biblical truth. So uh, all that to say, um, I love the first chapter. I think the second chapter is true. I, uh, the second rule, I think it's a great rule. I think it's a, applied wrongly. I do like his two, for, his, his two views of reality, a place of things and a forum for action. I think that's great. Um, I think it, it plays out all the time. When uh, there's a classic example of someone making tea uh, and you say, hey, why is that kettle boiling? And you go, well, at, at these conditions and this barometric pressure, water boils at this degree Fahrenheit. Like I forgot what it is. But uh, you could also say, why is why is the water boiling? Oh, because I wanted some tea and I put the water on. Do you want some too? That's that's the that's the world as a forum for action. The first one's the world of things. Like, why is this boiling? Let me get the facts on this. Oh, well, there's also a more important truth. Like, there's intention behind why that's boiling. So uh, I do love that that uh, distinction that he makes. I think it's really, really helpful. I do think it's helpful that you should imagine, uh, for you to imagine who you could be and then aim single-mindedly at that. That's a great principle. It's a great rule. You should do that. But I I suggest that... Uh, you, you aim higher at the true archetypal hero, not Marduk, but Jesus Christ, the God man who is truly God, truly man, who came down into human history in time and space, who, who died for the sins of the world and who uh, recon reconciles those who trust in him back to himself, who uh, instantiated, who inaugurated, inaugurated the kingdom of God, who lives and reigns on high. Man, it's I'm getting all sorts of Christian on you guys right now. But Peterson went there first, and he brought in uh, he brought in all this good stuff. So I I recommend you aim at the true myth, the myth that became fact. Um, awesome. So that is my take on rule number two: imagine who you could be, and then aim single mindedly at that. Stay tuned for rule number three. I don't even know what it is right now. Rule number three, sometime soon, is uh, do not hide unwanted things in the fog. Okay, so pay attention to that uh, for, for that to be released. Subscribe to the channel uh, to, so you don't miss any more of the rules to follow more of what I'm doing with the podcast. Uh, like, subscribe, share. If you've read the book, if you've read this, uh, this rule, let me know what you think. If you haven't, let me know what you think too. But uh, I actually want to hear from you guys. So please let me know. Peace.